All right, everyone see, okay. <clears throat> All right, so we're doing a chapter eight on annotations. And our learning objectives are the first section, there's four sections in the book. The first section is plot and access titles to which I would sort of further elaborate, sort of you know, providing context for a visual, providing metadata for a visual. Uh, and also kind of this chapter, I thought kind of gets you into the, into the sort of like changing the look in of plot elements and overall appearance conversation. Section two is on text labels, um, mapping text from data or having text appear on graphs as data. Uh, section three is building custom annotations uh, such as writing so arrows and adding context or uh, metadata to graphs. So where section two would be if you had like a scatter plot and each point, what, you know, like a sports example, um, you have like two sports metrics and then the, the dot and the scatter plot is like a sports team, you know, and then you'd use like geom text and then the name of that sports team appears instead of the dot. That's like section two here. Section three would be if you, you know, did like an arrow or like a text box or something that like pointed to that dot or pointed to some element in the, um, we'll see some in, in, in that graph. So we'll see some examples here shortly. And section four is direct labeling. Uh, so kind of an, uh, another option. Uh, and then faceting comes up, kind of how to deal with faceting when you have annotations. Uh, and then there's some related packages for uh, highlighting and text boxes and using Markdown or HTML text within some of the chart elements or uh, or some of the annotations. So here I, I used um, patch work for the first time. And so here's just a couple of the graphs. I used a couple different data sets. I used the penguins data set. Here's, you'll notice the uh, arrow there. And then um, this, the bottom of the, the line graph here show, will show GG highlight. So these three states are highlighted. So that's just, again, another overview of where we're going and, and, and a kind of a final overview of where we're going. We've got um, a lot of the sort of typical functions or functions within ggplot, such as gm text, gm label uh, labs, which is where you can put in title, subtitle, captions. Um, this theme is kind of easier to show with within the examples, but the theme kind of is where you would change the elements of the axis or title and different things such as the, the size or the placements, uh, GM curve, GM V line or, or other things we'll see. Uh, some other packages G, G, that I'll use a lot, GG text, GG theme, GG highlight. Um, I mentioned this in the Slack, but this GG plot tutorial for beautiful plotting by R by Sidra Chur, August, which is posted in August of 2019. I use that pretty extensively. So some of my examples will be inspired by that once we get into the later sections. So that's kind of the overview. Um, I've got a couple of definitions here. And so then I'll kind of ask what your take is on these definitions. So from the, the text, the ggplot2 text, uh, it says conceptually an annotation supplies metadata for the plot. That is, it provides additional information about the data being displayed. From a practical standpoint, however, metadata is just another form of data. Because of this, the annotation tools in ggplot2 reuse the same geoms that are used to create other plots. So really kind of focuses on, again, like on metadata. Um, and then from the book data visualization, the, the Andy Kirk states, annotation concerns judging the level of assistance an audience may require in order to understand the background function and purpose of a project, as well as what guidance needs to be provided to help viewers perceive and interpret the data representations. I thought that last element was kind of interesting. Cause so you've got a couple kind of things there is, you know, do you put annotations or titles to sort of explain the main point of the graph, to explain the main findings, to, to get interest in what's gonna, what the person's gonna see, or do you use annotations to sort of explain the graphs and the perception issues of like how, how this is how you should perceive this. This is, 
you know, this is what this shading means. This, this is, you know, a clustered bar graph. This is what the bottom part means. This is what the top part means. Um, so any, um, any reactions to those definitions? Do those seem to land or anything that's missing there or anything that you'd call out differently? I was going to add, uh, Mike, to the uh, Tufty mindset of, of being able to uh, provide guidance to the user without textual like so you're you're getting into a lot of the uh, aesthetics uh, or the the color codes and and, and whatnot uh, to make the information more presentable uh, almost kind of uh, self-intuitive um, if you label too much then the graph becomes too busy or or you've got too much going on and and, and actually it creates more confusion so um, simplicity is usually often better but if you if you don't add what those colors imply uh, maybe that's difficult to uh, uh, render or, or interpret what the what the image is giving you. Um, I like that that uh, quote. That's a really good way of saying uh, stating it. There's another user. Uh, it's I believe it's a, a Swiss or Swedish uh, uh, statistician that did some really great um, presentation using graphical media. Um, it was it had to do with. Uh, uh, I think it was societies uh, or cultures as they developed across Europe. Um, I thought that was a really great presentation. Um, I'll find the user's name. Um, if anybody knows off the top of their head, that's another great uh, add in to this uh, topic anyway. Yeah, there, there's a couple of things there that I'll maybe come back to as well because I think it relates to some of the, some of the next points. Um, I think that's really great. And you know, the, the chapter, kind of like a lot of chapters in this book, I mean, it, it, you know, it focuses a lot on the, the ggplot, the programming, the syntax, and it doesn't, it focuses a little bit, but not a lot on like some of those decisions, like where, you know, what, what's the best decision. So, um, you know, and there's some other resources, but that's why I kind of I think this is a good conversation to address some of those things that weren't, you know, from, from our, our collective experience and, and other things that, that weren't in the book to add to it. But yeah, I like what this kind of interesting, like you're like, you're kind of saying the point of some of these visuals is so you don't have to say everything. So you have a color scheme, which points out a heat map. And so you don't have to label a hundred parts of a heat map because you, you can label the legend, which explains it. And then, so that, yeah, that's interesting kind of speaks to, cause a lot of the, a lot of, I don't know, like, I feel like in my experience, there's not a lot of annotation. I mean, there is, if you look at like data visualization, journalism, kind of, you, you'll see that, but in like a business graph, often there's not a lot of additional annotations. It almost makes me like, oh, how can we add more to make things more clear? But, you know, there's a balance there, but I'll, I'll move on here. So uh, section one, plot and access titles. Um, here I've got this graph from the Palmer Penguins data set that um, mimics um, some of the graphs in the book. Um, and so here, I'll go back to the code here in a second. If you see scatterplot, there's three penguin species and we have the length and width of their beaks and the symbols are their, the averages. So this circular symbol is like the average length and width of this Adelai. Um, penguin species. Um, so obviously you have a title uh, here. I just I have like a subtitle um, in this ggplot2 book club that's like captioned. So, you know, probably pretty familiar to a lot of you, but here, I know I've used ggtitle in the past, um, but here um, you've got, uh, you know, here's the basic code, you know, so you just kind of add plus labs and then within the labs parentheses, you add the title, you know, the double parentheses here's for the title, here's the subtitle, uh, caption. And I guess that one el interesting element here is you can tell that this length here is italicized, whereas width is not. Um, so there is a way to use some markdown or HTML language within or, or, or the book states you can use some, implying that not everything works. 
um, within within the labs. And so all you have to do is just to, you know how the, how that works is here within the label itself, you know the x axis. This is obviously very simple syntax, but it's basically like a markdown or, or HTML syntax. Uh, and so you put that, and then in the theme where you do plus theme, so you have theme in parentheses, axis dot title. So that's you know the element that you're wanting to change, and then um, GG text element markdown. So you're writing the markdown in the parentheses, and then you're just adding this theme, which is just allowing it to interpret that what you wrote in markdown. And so then you're seeing, you're not seeing these italics, you're seeing the, itali the italicized word length. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, another just brief on labels. Uh, in, in a title, you can do backslash n to do a line break um, with, you know, so within the parentheses. So you have like a title in parentheses and in the middle of those parentheses, you decide on a line break and you just put in backslash n and then backslash n should not appear, but it should you know, create a line break for you. The book talks a little bit about quotes, which you would use within access titles if you were wanting to display mathematical expressions, such as if you did, you know, to the power of three and you might do that little like carrot to the power of three, but then with, if it's in, within quotes, you don't see the carrot, you just see your number to the power of three. So kind of a specialized case there. Uh, and there's two ways of removing labels if you wanna completely remove X and Y labels. One is to do the quotes with nothing in it, which is gonna maintain the space that that previous label was at um, or null and then that's, there's no longer a space and then the, the graph kind of gets bigger. And as with pretty much everything in this chapter, there's a lot of things that you just kind of would iterate through and decide what you like best. Um, so I wanted to get back. To, uh, so before getting to the text labels here, section two. Um, one thing I was reading this. In, uh, there's a couple reading this in the, the Andy Kirk book, um, and, and it also came up. I was rewatching. I don't know if you all had watched any of the videos for our studio global, but the. Um, John Byrne Murdoch from the Financial Times, who had like really popular COVID-19 trackers. Um, he gave it, he was one of the keynotes. Um, and he basically talked about putting the, the point of your, uh, of your graph in the title, um, as opposed to having a generic descriptive title. So for example, in, in his, him kind of explaining how that was put together, he had this very basic um, mock-up of his idea. Then he put, they put all the themes for, for the Financial Times on it. And okay, it looks better because now you have all the, the right colors. He's like, this still isn't, this still isn't uh, good to go. Uh, and then he changed the title from this very descriptive title to something like, you know, all these countries are on the, um, are, you know, are on the, all the Western countries are on the, the, this corner, coronavirus trajectory, uh, except a couple countries, whereas a couple countries were, we're not on that trajectory and putting sort of the point of the graph um, then allowed it to be more memorable as allowed to give a frame of reference for, for viewers of that graph when they were looking at it. And he gave kind of a couple of reasons for that. One was actually some studies show that a lot of the text is one of the things that's most memorable about graphs. So when, you know, as far as making your graph memorable, uh, making your visual memorable, one of the things that, it, that people will kind of latch on to is the text. And then the second point that he made was that for non-chart users, people who may not be as fluent with reading charts, the text can really help with that. So again, that, you know, all that to say, there's just kind of this point about um, kind of putting the main idea, again, in, in my, I guess in my default is like to put like, and I kind of did it, I guess, back here, you know, here, here I put a question. So that's a little bit better than just a descriptive statement, but you know, how does bill size differ by species? But you know, it doesn't, it does, there's no main point there as far as like why that matters or if you know, if there is scientific research, what the main point of that would be. But I don't know, any, any comments about that, about like the idea of what kind of content you would put in your title and whether it makes sense to put the meaning of or the results of your graph or not? I think it's a really good practice to try to put in the title the main point you're trying to make with the graph rather than 
just describing what the data is. It's, I find it can be challenging sometimes, but it's a really good practice. And just to your example, I think that was a good title. If, you know, if, if this was an, of course, it depends on the audience, but I could see this being, you know, presented to a class that's about understanding visualizations. And so it's like, okay, well, let me look at this and see how does bill size. Yeah. It's way better than just saying, you know, bill size of Palmer penguins or something, which is what <laughs> I probably would have put a couple of years ago before I started trying to think of, okay, what do, what do I want people to take away from this chart? And then any, any explanation that I think is needed, I'll put into the subtitle. So it's, you know, like, okay, well, what is this actually you're looking at? That's, it is important information, but it's not necessarily the most important thing that you want people to get from looking at it. So I've been trying to do that. I, I find it a good practice and as I say sometimes kind of challenging. Yeah. Anyways. I was going to say, I always smile when I see uh, reading scientific papers or, or white papers, use cases, et cetera. And you've got this extremely large thesis is your title of the document. Um, I always find that to be um, very hard to comprehend. Um, so I do appreciate or I do like the, the uh, statement Ken made or, or what, what you were referring to as just kind of posing a question and then allowing the user to interpret what that graphic is trying to portray. Um, it adds more context. Uh, it doesn't have to be so unbelievably wordy. Um, and you will often find some people will uh, label that as the figure caption or even as the file caption. And then you run into possible um, storage problems uh, if you try to name that uh, figure or name that, that image if you're producing it in a paper you'll actually uh, start running into problems with your, with your uh, compiling uh, because the, the, the file name is too large. I don't know, just another add on to that statement. Yeah, uh, yeah, with the question is kind of similar to um, with the, the like COVID example of like basically it, it primes the viewer on how they should be reading the graph or kind of what to look for. It's, you know, it's not, they're not looking just, um, cause then if you don't do that, then it's like, well, maybe they're just going to focus on what's the visual element that's most prominent. And then you get into that like visual perception research of like, oh, well, people look at this, the upper right corner, or they look at the, the, the thing that's highlighted. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what those, you know, those answers are, but then, but yeah, by the text, you kind of are able to either utilize those or, or subvert people's normal reaction to just looking at what color jumps out at them or something like that. So yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I've seen a lot of examples too of where yeah, the subtitle is used to describe. And so then you have a title, you have a little bit more leeway of making your point. Um, so section two, text labels. So geom text adds label text to the X and Y coordinates of a graph such as a name um, instead of a circle and a scatter plot, which is kind of the example I gave earlier. Um, and that, and so this sort of introduces the idea of figuring out an X, the X and Y coordinates of where you want your text on the graph and then entering those in. Um, and, you know, so the, the book talks a little bit about, you can do um, fonts with the family aesthetic. You can do the face, you can do bold, um, italic or underlined and um, it took, the, the packages show text and extra font can help with handling fonts across different devices. The book may, mainly just kind of links to those packages, but sometimes the rendering of fonts is different on different devices or different graphical devices. And so there's packages that help to alleviate those issues. This is just an example of, uh, from the book where here it says label equals face, which is just the, the variable that they created. Uh, and then font face equals face, which again is from here, but in a lot of cases you'd put uh, font face equals, and then like in parentheses, either bold or italic or whatever you would like. Um, size, the book points out that the size is in millimeters and not in points. To, so it's consistent with other size renderings in GDplot. Uh, here, angle equals 10. 
this is at a slight angle, as you can see. Uh, the V just and H just of inward, you know, that those are those are things to kind of keep it in the in the graph if you have a situation where your text is getting outside of the bounds. Um, so this I have primarily to show check overlap equals true. I also did the um, label. So this is GM text label equals body mass. So this is uh, sorry about that. So this is um, different in instead of so by labeling the body mass. Each of these are penguins. So there's this penguin that's 4600 body mass 4200 so instead of the dots or instead of something like a name and other examples uh if for example all these penguins had names or something you know you'd have you could do it where you have the name of each one uh here uh, label equals body mass and so then you see the body mass there and everything else is the same check overlap is true uh the book explains that the algorithm for that will will sort of start with the top of the data frame and you know, we'll keep the first thing. And then if the, if any subsequent item overlaps with something that's already been kept, it'll be removed. So that has potentially some limited functionality, but, um, uh, but if you order the data frame in the order that you want it, potentially that will work for you. So that's one way, basically check overlap equals true. So that's just one way to deal with trying to do a, a text label, a GM text uh, and, you know, having like a really messy kind of graph because of that. Uh, here, the only difference here is uh, this is a, an example of geom label. So here I didn't do check overlap. So I guess you can kind of see that as a contrast uh, to where it's more overlapping and you just really don't see a lot of things. Uh, and the, the geom underscore label, the, the focus there is just that it, it creates a, a, a rectangle with curved edges. Uh, and then here really this this is another another example from the book where you might want to do that if you have like a heat map and obviously here you have a couple um a, a couple rectangles that you wouldn't maybe see otherwise but with gm label it, it kind of creates that rectangle and allows you to see them then there is so this is this here another example from the book mile, from the miles per gallon data set uh, we've got GM text label equals car model, and obviously that's not doesn't look great. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of overlapping cars, and so you can use the GG repel package and used GM underscore text repel, uh, and that's just sort of a smart. You're still limited to it's not going to work if you have too many um, too many items, but that that does sort of more of a sophisticated repel where you know if you had three things on top of each other maybe one goes to the left the other goes to the right and the other goes above and so it's a way so that they're not on top of each other so that's section two so section three is annotations uh, GM text and GM label are other, uh, you know, sort of annotation, th those kinds of an annotations. Uh, GM rect or R-E-C-T, uh, I don't have any examples here. I had a little bit of trouble. I think maybe just you need to get the layers right of what order in which you're doing your plotting with that. But that was, there's kind of a good example where there is a line graph and then there's an additional data set with political party and so the different colors, which, so then using GM RECT with that allowed for the political party's color, you know, red or blue to sort of be a backdrop to that. So you, you know who is president when, and that kind of worked out well. Um, I used uh, GM V line and GM H line, which just draws lines. Uh, and then I'll give an example with annotate, uh, which can be used in combinations with arrows here in a moment. So, here, first of all, is just an example of annotate um, used kind of like GM text was. So it's just kind of the same thing where you see the annotate function. Here you say GM equals text within that function. And then you see X equals 42, Y equals 20 for um, this particular label um, that I have here. And so that, you know, as you can see 42 here and 20 here. So that's about a middle of this text that you see there. 
And so that's kind of like the default that I've noticed is it sort of, you sort of are choosing the middle of, all, of a lot of text boxes or, or text areas. Uh, and then you can change that with some of the like V just or H just, you can change that, but usually it kind of starts in the middle. So this is just to show the annotate works similarly. Um, so here I've got the arrows, as you can see here. So we just want to go over the code here and then, then that kind of leads to, uh, and then I'll show another graph and then I have a kind of a question related to that, kind of the arrows. So, so there's two elements here. So one, so you've got the annotate function, you've got geom equals curve, and then you've got geom equals text and then it repeats for, for different. So it's basically just the, these, you know, these two annotate functions combined to create that. So you've got um, X and Y, 53 and 20 is where the line starts, 49 and 18.5, that's where it ends. So that's just indicating, um, I think this one is the chin strap. So you know, here's, here's where that starts, the first X and Y, and then the second X and Y is here. Um, and the rest of this is pretty much, you can just kind of copy and paste it and iterate through it to see if it gives you other options, but I guess, you know, the size is relevant. And then curvature 0.3, if you, you know, put 0.6, it'll look quite different. So you can kind of just check that and see if it looks, iterate through that. So the second part, annotate geom equals text, the same thing. So here, obviously this is very similar. So 53.1 and then 53, 20, um, and then 20. And so that's, you know, 53, 20. So that's, you know, that's the same as the start because we want it, the text to be right there. Uh, and here's, yeah, H just equals left. That's what allowed this text to start here as opposed to, uh, I think, yeah, basically what that means in this circumstance is that I want the text to start here. Whereas the, again, the, auto, the uh, default was where it starts in the middle. Um, you know, so if you didn't do the HS, it would be like average chin strap would be here, the middle of these two words would sort of be in this particular area. Um, and so that, yeah, that's pretty much it on the curve to the arrow. Um, here, I kind of, uh, I was another Cedric Shear graph kind of inspired this where he uses a box plot and a dot plot. Here I used the Tidy Tuesday 2020 week 29 um, to do Uh, the x-axis is the hours of astronaut missions, and then the y-axis here is different countries. So um, anyways, the main reason I did this was just to try to find another example of the, the arrows. So here, I don't know if this is a little bit small, uh, it says the interquartile range between 25% and 75% of values, and then the arrow points to this interquartile range. Here it says the US mean hours mission and it points to this blue dot, which is the mean of this distribution. So, um, so again, the idea there is those are examples of where the annotation or where the arrow specifically describes like how to read the plot. And maybe, maybe theoretically, if, if you have an audience that isn't super, uh, fluent with visualizations and might not exactly know how to read a box plot at first glance, you could explain what it is or, or, or a different kind of visualization. Um, here I put, you know, the astronaut, this is Australia. I, you know, I chose these somewhat at random. This is Australian astronaut Andrew S.W. Thomas completed missions in 1983, 98, 2001, and 2005. So you can use it um, just to kind of call out aspects of the data as well. Um, 
And yeah, one point kind of to Ryan's earlier point, and, and I guess, and this this theme is the 538 theme, which is this gray background. But one thing, you know, if you, if you, if you go, if you look at like the top, um, uh, if you get, you know, if you go to, uh, if you look at 538's website, they have like a, they're kind of their favorite or they, what they call like the best and weirdest charts of the year. If you look at that, you'll notice that like they almost use arrows by default. Like it's like, if, can you possibly use an arrow in this chart? Then they'll do it. And like, so they rarely don't use an arrow. Uh, I think it's just a really great example of different ways to use arrows and, and, and essentially then just to use annotations in general. Um, and so you have you have something sort of used similar to um, to labeling text where you'll have like a scatter plot of presidential candidates and then you'll have an arrow pointing to the particular candidate of interest. In some days it'll point out a really specific aspect of um, uh, you know of the data. Maybe it's there's a bunch of data and, and then the arrow points to okay, here's this specific day. And then there's a little story about what happened on that specific day in the, in the text. Um, and why I said it was relevant to kind of what Ryan said is often you get these situations where the arrows are, are, are kind of used strategically, uh, almost in some cases in place of have, having to do a lot of legend or a lot of summary work and kind of pointing out, hey, this is how, um, this is, this explains one of the, like you have a bar graph, this explains one of the bars. And so then you can extrapolate now that you understand one bar, you can understand the rest of them. And so you can kind of strategically place annotations to, to set up the patterns and understanding of the plot without having to label every individual thing. Um, so, so yeah, I was just gonna stop here and just ask kind of a question just sort of around um, you, you know, I don't know if you specifically use arrows, but you know, are there other ways you could use arrows or other ways you could add text information within a graph to illustrate it? And, and have you had any issues with it being too much information or, or any issues where you can just label one point and then it, it sort of um, is a really efficient use of text? or any general comments about these, these sections? One thing that I do try to do sometimes is get rid of a legend by using the colors somewhere else, like in the title to the plot or an associated text that's right next to it. So you um, just takes, frees up some space for the plot and makes it a little more natural to understand what the colors are. There was a question about the arrows in the in the chat that I had a partial answer to, but um, Ed was asking about how different resolution screens and plot sizes and things affect the arrow layout. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, um, that's the issue with that can be an issue with text. So is it an issue with the arrow itself? Um, I guess I would assume so. I mean, um, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, if you're, um, I guess that would be something to look for. And if your text, if your text really changes, does that then put it where it's not, you know, instead of being here with the, the label, it, you know, it's not lined up, you know, like, so yeah, yeah like, I don't know. The book didn't really go into that. Um, I have an example later on with annotations and faceting where there's like a package where you you set where the annot where the text is on the screen based on like a scale. And then that prevents prevents the text from, from looking differently with different um, X limb and Y limbs and, and different facets. Uh, but I don't really know. Yeah, so Lynn, line width and arrow size would be subject to resolution, but not the standard endpoints. Start endpoints are right, yeah. to native coordinate units, but size is absolute. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a problem sometimes. 
because you if you forgot to save the, save your plot uh, as a PNG and then see how the, the resolution uh, and the position of all the things that you put inside is, uh, you need to do that again. Uh, so like if you have spent time arranging uh, arrows and points and uh, piece of text uh, in the plot as the resolution of your as studio is, uh, and then when you save it, it changes completely. So best practice for, my, my suggestion is to save the plot and then arrange the things and then save it, save it, save it again while you arrange it. Yeah, that's really I don't know, this is, this is the way I do, but <laughs> maybe there's a, a more, uh, another way to do that. That would be useful to know. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. I think June said something similar in the chat, which is, you know, so you should never rely just on plot panel output and always use something like GG save. So that's kind of new. That's all that's kind of new to me, but that makes sense. Was there any other? I was going to say, I was going to comment, Mike, the, uh, there's a GitHub package that I'm searching for frantically, uh, but it, it was related to arrows in general. And the topic was more related to HTML and, and vector graphics. I wanted to cite the, the page. It allows users in CSS and, and I don't think it's in JavaScript. I think it's in CSS, but to apply arrows to vector graphics on web when we discussed ggplot and the option of exporting your plot as a vector graphic, you might be able to uh, add another layer on top of the, the vector in web development or web, web output, um, not related to internal to the ggplot or the arrow uh, call function within there. Um, just a side note, I was just throwing that out there. It, it was related to Ed's comment and, and Ken, it was, it was uh, supporting your uh, statement. Um, I'm still searching for it. I don't know if some of those issues are kind of maybe also addressed a little bit more in the second sec in the next sections of the ggplot2 book too, maybe. But, um, so like it seems like it a little bit more in the technical aspect um, anything else there? Let's see. All right, I'll just, uh, I guess, yeah, feel free to keep, there's more on the chat here. Feel free to put more in the chat or, or on Slack for resources there. So those are definitely things I wasn't super aware of and didn't uh, uh, really include because I wasn't aware of them, but it was, this would be good to check out. So just a, Real quick here, there's a few other packages listed. This is basically section four of the book. Uh, there's direct labels. So maybe at first glance, you're like, why is this any different? But here by doing the direct labels, the name of each of these penguins is in the graph itself. There's no line. It's, it's just kind of, it shows a, a, a logical place for them to be. And so here's an example where you can maybe efficiently get labels within the graph as opposed to on a legend that's off to the side. And that was one thing that came up with, um, with annotations in general, it's just this idea of getting the text closer to the data as opposed to having to sort of look over to the legend and look back. Direct labels is a way to do that. Uh, GG Force was mentioned. I don't really have any examples from that. GG Highlight was an example that there was an, a line graph in the book, and I really liked, uh, really liked that. So I kind of expanded on that. Um, here is a line graph of this. Is another I don't have I don't have all the captions I, I should have here, but this is another Tidy Tuesday data set. Um, and go back here so. I arbitrarily chose some Midwestern states. The data had all 50 United States. Um, and uh, I just used, there was a lot of salary um, data in the data set. I just kind of chose annual median. 
you know, we have our labs like usual. Um, I'll talk about the V line and uh, this is the theme economist. So that's this like light blue background and some of the choices there come from this theme economist. So that's from GG themes. Uh, and so here, GG highlight was one of the sort of the arrows and G just general geom text. And then GG highlight were kind of three of the things that really stood out most to me in the chapter that I thought were really cool. Here, I just used GG highlight. Um, and then I just sort of specifically choose three states. Again, for my present examples, I mean, I, I live in Minnesota, but essentially at random. Um, and um, the, it's the one cool thing about the GG highlight is you can also do sort of equations or expressions in there. So if it's like, you know, this, you have some data and like, what's a, everything that's above 50,000, I want highlighted. And then that'll highlight those, those values. And so there's more to the GG highlight package than I'm currently using um, here. You know, I was inspired by the geom underscore RECT package that I had a little bit of trouble with because I was initially like, oh, that would be cool to use to, to, to show the Great Recession. And like, I, it just didn't look good when I did it. But here, so here I just did this uh, V line. So this is supposed to represent 2007 to 2009. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can kind of imagine hypothetical analyses here. So like, oh, Minnesota, Minnesota's, so we're seeing salaries go up. And, and of course, this, this is not like uh, inflation adjusted or, or, or anything, but you're seeing it go up and so you go through the recession and it keeps going. But then once you get a little bit farther, things even out. Uh, whereas other ones like Wisconsin here, uh, you know, oops, it kind of, it kind of like, it doesn't get as flat, but it goes, it starts going down a little bit earlier. Or some of these you see, like, I don't know what the one this is, uh, but you know, like right in the middle, all of a sudden salaries went down. So I don't know, you know, it's uh, a little bit of a speculation with the current visual and data that I have in, in front of me. But, you know, in theory, you could see, you know, kind of, that's kind of what, potentially the V-line is helping with is highlighting certain areas on a line graph. The text is adding geom V-line, x-intercept is 2007, 2009, so I chose those years. Uh, size, color, and then line type equals dashed. Um, and then going to ask a question. I can't quite remember what I was going to ask, but it's this one brief part about facets that I'm kind of done with the presentation. So any, any comments about GG highlights or V lines or GM RECT or anything else related to this section? V lines are really easy to add. That's one nice thing about them. Although I usually try to put some kind of a label on it as well to show what, show what it is. <laughs> Sometimes you can get away with calling it out in the, in the caption. Right. But they're a lot yeah. easier to position than text and arrows and some of the other things. Right, I was imagining, um, yeah, I just clearly should have done more with this here if I would have, I'm just kind of noticing how bare it is, but like, yeah, you could have like an arrow, maybe you're pointing the, to the arrow or, or just a text box. It's just something that says recession, you know? Yeah. Or, you know, um, and, the, and, and theoretically, you know, I mean, again, obviously it depends on your context, but, you know, theoretically you could have a lot of information in a text box about the recession or, or your, the study that you're trying to analysis you're trying to do. I could see something like this yeah. having a lot of room for that. Or at least if it was something you're always just putting out for a tidy Tuesday, I'd probably just have a bunch of text boxes and try to like make, have, tell a story or something like that. Which there's at least space for that. Um, yeah. One cool thing about GG Highlight is if you do, so I, you know, I call GG Highlight like this, GG Highlight, GG Highlight. Mm. Um, and then I do a facet wrap on this on species of penguins. Uh, and you'll notice that the Adelaide here is in red, so only this penguin is highlighted. And here, chin strap is in green, only that one is. And same with the Gentoo. 
So it sort of automatically is highlighting each facet based on what that facet is, which I thought was cool. Um, not sure if that's standard uh, for other things, but I thought that was cool here. I've got a better, yeah, here's just showing the GG text package um, where you create a label and um, unfortunately I didn't realize this text is hard to read, but um, you use GM rich, rich text. And then that's again, your label. And here in this label, like you can see this number here is like HTML to, to make a star. And like, here's a star um, on this label. And, um, and so then by using GM rich, rich text from the GG text package, um, it allows you to use HTML in there. I, I don't know if people actually do that. That I, I haven't like I don't know HTML that much, but it seems like a really cool thing to do. Um, and here, this is a text box again from GG Text, where you use GM text box. And again, you're kind of labeling where you want it. Your label equals what I've defined up here. Again, this is in like HTML. Um, one thing, this is kind of sidetracking again, this stat equals unique, you'll want to do a GM text bot or GM text uh, because otherwise, uh, otherwise GM uh, underscore text will sort of like create a lot of, like, something like however many data points will be however, how, how, be how many versions of that text are created. So in other words, it just gets kind of really blurry. Uh, whereas if you do stat equals unique, it will just look like a, it'll look almost like bolded. I don't really have an example here, but like if you do static, stat, if you if your text looks odd, it may be that you need to do static was unique, and then it will look better. But that's just an aside. Um, so here's text text box, um, which just gives you a little bit more room because you can kind of set the width and some different things. So it gives you a little bit more control over a box as opposed to GM text alone. But I just I, I'm just curious if people have used, do you, people use HTML and CSS and anything or like, you know, you, you write type in a presentation and uh, in a ggplot, is that beneficial? Seems nice to be able to do color and, and highlights. I, I guess the, um, the markdown format gives you bold. Mm -hmm. But this gives you even more flexibility. I've I've used HTML a lot in um, the annotations in leaflet maps, which is a little bit different. But um, it's nice to be able to format things and put links in them, especially. I've I've done that a lot, but mm -hmm. not so much in ggplot. I came into the conversation or I came into the book club cohort ggplot uh, concept way, way, way late in my, in my uh, use of a lot of HTML and CSS, vector graphics, et cetera. The, when I discovered that R was using reveal.js as a presentation option, that's all HTML based. And so therefore you can start to do some awesome JavaScript and some other details surrounding your presentation media a lot of the details that we're discussing in ggplot, I haven't exercised within our studio in generating the reveal side of things. So right now, the my current workflow is is kind of different. Uh, uh, the content is kind of separated at the moment. I'm trying to draw them together so I stay within one IDE. But um, to answer the question, or or just using HTML and, and CSS, yes, uh, I use it very heavily in just documentation in general, web output type documentation. It expands beyond just markdown documents. There's a lot more that you can do with uh, just raw HTML, especially posting it into your rendering of the plot and then uh, whatever output uh, you would control from that point, so. Cool. All right, so I wanna get to the end here. Basically on, the if you're fast basically i just copied and pasted this text from the the cedric's here website here where like here you know here i've got facets and i have this text great recession and i set it through by scale so x equals 0.2 y equals 0.9 and so, so you know so 
uh, 0.9, so why? So that's high, right? Because if it's zero to one, 0.9 is high. And then, um, so basically this, you know, uh, I don't know how to explain the text. I just kind of copied and pasted it here, but basically you could check out that resource if you ever are using faceting with annotations and your annotations are not in the right spots because maybe you have uh, uh, you know scales free and, and your scales are differing based on the different plots and your annotations are going in different places, there is a way to set it hmm. to a scale, but you know, don't know. Um, that's from a ggplot tutorial for beautiful plotting in R. Um, and yeah, so don't know a lot about that, but I just, you know, kind of copied and pasted that. And I thought, I thought it really like there, there's an annotation section of the book uh, and it kind of, it's kind of short and in, in doesn't necessarily address that. So I think that's where, um, that's where, um, you know, that, that can help. Um, so yeah, here's the, I'm going to cover the Cedric, a couple of the Cedric Shearer resources, you know, obviously there's the packages related, related. So here's a GG, you know, GG highlight package. Uh, you know, you can get to the R studio talks online for free. Of course, this is the one I was referring to there, which I think is a good listen. If you haven't before it talks about some other things too, in terms of your message in creating visuals, but, um, yeah, any, um, and I had like, I guess I had the, redid the learning objectives. So um, any, anything else, any, any, anything that you, anyone else wants to add in terms of this, this topic or things that were missed or things in the book that I didn't talk about or things you want to add? You did a really nice job, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for all your feedback. They, they Thank you. That. Yeah, a lot of great, a lot of great thing. Yeah, a lot of great resources there. Um, next week, I believe we have the patchwork essentially in the next chapter. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got. I don't think I don't know if anyone. I don't think Priyanka's on. I don't think there's any announcements or anything. But. Um, so yeah, just keep keep putting things in um, Slack. People have other resources. I'm curious what you used um, to do the highlights in your uh, code output. It's very nice the way you can move the cursor up and down and highlight different lines. Yeah, I did. Uh, so I uh, when I did a new R markdown, I did the template Sheringen themer, I believe is uh -huh. it. And then, and then there's a package. Oh, shoot, I'll, I'll maybe I put that in the Slack. So I think okay. there's, a, there's a couple of different sharing and things, but based, I think it's sharing and themer or sharing and oh, sharing and extra. So I think that so the template is sharing and themer, and then there's a package called sharing and extra, and basically there's um, I don't know if I have my I have my actual R section here. So if you look at, so there's a few things like this, so panel select tile view, and here's, here's the code that allows that hover. So it's sharing an oh. extra, use extra styles, hover code line equals true, uh, mute on highlight code equals true. So yeah, so you just have to I think you might have to do the sharing and being like a sharing and presentation or the mm -hmm. sharing and template. But then if you are, and then I guess, you know, maybe you had to have that extra installed uh, and then you just add copy and paste this code. And there, there is a nice, I'll put a, there's a website in the uh, online that I'll put in the Slack that basically has like all the options. Like, so panel, the tile view, I think is really cool. You press O and it does this where you can kind of look at your whole presentation and choose things. So I know that that's on account of this um, tile view part. And so, yeah, basically you kind of look at all these different features and then you choose the ones you want and then, uh, you know, copy and paste the code just at the beginning um, of your of your presentation. Cool, thanks. Yeah. 
That's awesome, sir. Thanks for the input. All right. Thanks, everyone.